Uh, my name is Samit, and this is my colleague uh, Sashi. We want to talk about uh, VPP-based uh, data plane for uh, Sonic. Uh, before we go, just a show of hands, how many folks are familiar with VPP so I can kind of calibrate to what depth? Okay, just a handful. Okay, so let me, <coughs> I'll touch upon that a little bit. So this whole thing started off as basically we had some internal requirements from our side in terms of how do I test Sonic at scale and high performance. And with the, uh, with the current VS switch, we had a certain amount of drawbacks in terms of throughput and features. And that kind of led us into this particular uh, scenario, right? And then we also figured out there are a couple of other scenarios like what was mentioned in the previous talk about uh, the uh, cloud router and so forth. <coughs> Um, so these were the motivations that actually, uh, so we wanted a data path that's very performant, feature rich, uh, it's kind of open source, works on multiple hardwares, right, from foundational NICs to smart NICs to DPUs and whatnot, and also kind of overcomes the existing limitations. So this has a broad swath of applicability from what we, the way we see this. Okay, so I'll kind of not skip onto this, don't want to kind of highlight this, but yeah, this is the limitations that kind of drove us into what we wanted to do, limited performance and limited feature set. Uh, okay, so I'll kind of briefly touch upon what VPP is. It's an open source uh, packet processing engine, which kind of heavily uses vectorizing constructs uh, to kind of uh, get you a pretty good performance on x86 and ARM kind of uh, CPUs. It also basically is ported onto a DPU, so you could actually use that along with the DPUs. Uh, from a performance pers feature perspective, it's pretty reasonably pretty much good in terms of features. And in terms of performance, just to give you guys an idea, if you take an Ice Lake uh, CPU, uh, dual socket, you probably get around 1.2 terabit just for uh, V4 forwarding. These are all racetrack numbers. And then for IPsec, you get somewhere around 1 terabit. The thing is, once you start adding features, the numbers start dropping down, but that gives you the idea of the performance levels that we're looking at. Now, <clears throat> before we get into the architecture, so the, one of the reasons we wanted to have a chat here was to get the community feedback so that we can kind of start contributing this stuff uh, in, uh, upstream in the source code that we have at this point in time. So we've been kind of considering three deployment models, uh, single host, single host with DPU, and multi-host. This talk will kind of primarily focus on single host, but I'll kind of give you the thought process behind how we want to actually take this forward. In the single host, you have a Sonic container, you have a VPP container, and that runs on a basic foundation of Linux. Everything could be packaged as one gigantic cont uh, container, or maybe you could have a set of containers. Now that kind of logically expands onto basically <coughs> onto a DPU, where you have a server with DPU kind of in. Sonic runs a container or a set of containers, and the VPP portion basically runs on the DPU side of things. So you could potentially get some pretty good acceleration that we're looking at. And the third scenario basically is a single control plane, multiple data planes. So, so Sonic runs on a server, and then you have VPP-based data planes on several servers. So this is how we kind of foresee uh, the evolution of the software data plane as far as uh, from a Sonic perspective. Just a foundational <coughs> taxonomy so that once we get to the architecture, <coughs> you, you, you're kind of aware of the terminologies that we'll be using. Is If you look at Sonic today, you have uh, a margin silicon and the front panel ports are what Sonic sees. In the context of a server, you basically would probably, depending upon the scenario that you choose, SROIV or pass-through, you'd actually, if it is SROIV, you'd actually be looking at the virtual functions or all the what uh, Sonic would actually be seeing. And in the case of pass-through, it'll be the physical functions that what Sonic sees. So we'll kind of be using this once we get to the architecture. Sashi, it's up to you. Yeah. Thanks, Amit. Uh, I'll try to expand upon what you know Samir mentioned in the single host model. Uh, it essentially, right, uh, we'll begin with the, the server architecture and then explain the blocks and then make this whole architectural uh, piece, right, functional, right? Um, to begin with, uh, the server has NIC ports, port zero, port one here representative, uh, mapped to the virtual functions. And these virtual functions are again mapped to Ethernet zero to Ethernet one in the Linux uh, kernel network namespace. Um, <coughs> uh, that explains the, you know, the hardware side of things. And then we have uh, blocks, uh, the blue block uh, with Sonic with uh, control processes, uh, right, running there with uh, various databases. Uh, and then we have VPP container here in the orange. Uh, again, VPP process with uh, worker threads master and uh, Psi agent. 
and the psi VPP. So those uh, two green boxes, right, which I tried to, I'm trying to highlight here, are the additions which we have done, right? And they are the important, uh, important part of the uh, this architecture. If we understand those, I think you know the following slides. Uh, it's much easier to uh, understand. Okay, so now that I think we have covered all the logical blocks here, uh, we can see like you know how it gets operational. So we have on the extreme corner there platform JSON, hardware rescue JSON. So it is supposed to contain you know two things now. Uh, along uh, first is the Sonic configuration. Where you know we configure the ports, surveys, uh, all that, uh, right? And along with that, we will have uh, VPP-specific configuration, and we have this VPP, you know, platform service layer, which extracts that uh, configuration and programs, uh, right? Uh, it, sorry, it instantiates uh, the VPP container, right, with a startup config being generated out of uh, the configuration derived from that platform. JSON. <clears throat> now, uh, the VPP is functional, but functional as in it's booted up, but it's not like you know doing any uh, routing uh, right required. So then, uh, the rest of the Sonic boots up, uh, the processes uh, run, and basically, essentially, config DB right uh, derived configuration reaches the ASIC DB somehow, uh, and. The Psi VPP layer I just uh, briefly mentioned in the uh, right uh, in the past kicks in, and you can see the green uh, right. So that follows the passing of the configuration across to the VPP, and VPP configures that uh, using the binary API here. Now we have routes, adjacencies, uh, right, and features, right. If you configure uh, in the VPP available, so now it becomes operational. Okay. In the next slide, uh, API semantics. Uh, this slide is about uh, <clears throat> to point out the differences between the API. Uh, I think this is the whole crux of uh, the Sonic VPP integration. Uh, Psi follows the CRUD model, right? Uh, it does the CRUD operations on you know standard set of object types, approximately 100 what we see right now. And these are like, you know, again, CRUD operations, fixed set of operations. Um, <clears throat> so the whole idea is, you know, how do we map on the VPP? On the VPP side, you know, it's again like a bunch of uh, uh, messages, and there are like a whole lot of messages here, and they have a different mechanism, as in the, they, they follow the method types of request reply. You want to configure, send request reply. You want to do a get, dump, uh, uh, and get the detail right in response. That's how uh, the uh, the VPP uh, right does the configuration. Okay, and this you know uh, requires uh, you know some translation logic. It's not like you know straightforward, not simple, and in some cases we need to maintain the state uh, right wherever we are trying to right configure uh, the VPP. So, uh, to explain the you know, uh, differences, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, before we jump onto the API itself, you know, just briefly go over uh, the, the the below one here, the Psi VPP and the VPP, right? And these are the important uh, two blocks for us. Uh, the existing Sonic, I think, we are all aware of, right? Uh, configuration uh, comes in various uh, right v APIs, and we do a request here uh, and response. Uh, VPP does support <coughs> notifications, and these notifications can again you know can be transmitted up to the control plane, and that's how right the existing uh, functionality uh, for the API handling. Um, I'll just point out, you know, <clears throat> two things here. Uh, we can see at the, you know, Sonic operation route add. Uh, can see there is create route entry and uh, right corresponding to that uh, on the VPP side, we need to call, you know, uh, route add delete. Right, one API call, 
you pass the operation as you know add or uh, delete right same applies to the remove and i think the set is a very interesting operation uh, where uh, in sonic uh, a set is attribute modification right on a given object type uh, attribute gets modified but correspondingly there is no uh, right uh, API available on the VPP. So you still, you need to go ahead, get rid of the existing route. So this way, you know, you need to maintain the state and then add with the updated uh, attributes. So these are some of the nuances, uh, right? We have to take care uh, in, the, in the API. I think uh, now we have got the API running and we need to go into the VPP communication. Um, VPP communication, we came up with you know two uh, designs, uh, right? For for communicating with the VPP from the Sonic uh, option A, you can see here, uh, right? Um, Sonic using the gRPC and uh, passing the information, right? And uh, basically uh, messaging of the configuration across to the VPP. Um, here, uh, there is a need to you know, build a new uh, gRPC messaging, and it essentially you know, hides the whole VPP logic. So the sounding doesn't have to uh, right, worry about uh, right, uh, the intricacies of uh, VPP. And option B is a you know, straightforward one, uh, you can see, uh, directly you know link the uh, v vpp lib to the sonic and directly you know you can initiate those epa uh, messages uh, which get configured on the vpp okay uh, the downside i think it's very clear here uh, container tied to vpp version but the good thing is it's you know straightforward to implement okay i think um, we have been through uh, the architecture control uh, API uh, control plane. I think we made it uh, functional, uh, but yet packets haven't right uh, been passing. So that means route is router is still not functional. So to do that, I'll test it. So what we will do is uh, I'll send a right. I'll try to do a ping uh, first to you know one of those addresses in the Ethernet zero. Uh, you can follow, you know, those uh, circles with the right, as mentioned, the legend. The art broadcast is sent from the host A, you know, reaches the port zero. It uh, it's a broadcast, so it it, it is forwarded to all the VFs, and <clears throat> the VPP. Um, uh, there is a logic built in the VPP, uh, right? By two means, if it is a you know shared namespace. Uh, what happens like uh, is that the packet uh, directly gets you know taken from the Linux uh, plugin CP plugin called it it's called control plane plugin and it in it injects it into the kernel and kernel uh, right Linux kernel right being functional with IP addresses so it responds back and you can see that the packet reaches back to the VPP through the injection okay and it is intercepted and then it follows the path outside uh, back to the host A. So now we have the ARP completely resolved and the right adjacencies created uh, uh, both at the VPP as well as in the Linux kernel. So uh, this is to highlight, you know, just to explain um, a simple route add flow. Um, I'll try to explain with the simple uh, shell, you know, route add. You can do the IP route add, and when you do the IP route add, it, it gets programmed in the Linux kernel down in the uh, in the diagram here. <coughs> and there are two mechanisms here. In, in one of them, uh, if it is a shared uh, namespace, shared network namespace. Uh, the, the Netlink plugin takes care of it, uh, takes care of you know, taking the port configuration, route configuration, adjacencies, and uh, right configures the VPP. So it does it for free, but we have to be in the same network namespace. 
uh, if we are not in the same network name space, uh, as in we have separate name spaces running for, say, Sony container and VPP container, if they are distributed, right? In that case, the route actually comes through the above, uh, right, Sonic blue box. So it comes to the, you know, goes to the zebra, uh, I may be a little uh, out here, uh, and eventually it comes to the FPM sync and gets returned to uh, various DBs, and then uh, the, the green box, which we have implemented for messaging for the API. So that takes care of, uh, sending that message across to the VPP and the routes adjacencies get configured there. Uh, now you can see, you know, uh, packets are flowing, routes are functional. Uh, over to Samir now. Thank you. Yeah. So I think where we stand today is we have an implementation with the functions that you can see on column one. Uh, we'd like to basically get a solicit community support and then see how we can actually contribute this back or upstream this back. So this is the state where we're in. And I think, thank you very much. We'll take any questions if there are any. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, uh, is this already available in the community somewhere so we, someone can try, or it's only internally for now? Right now, it's just with us, but we plan to basically get it to the community, so. Okay, thanks. I had a very foundational question. Like, I mean, there is a bunch of packet processor like DPDK and such available. Did you guys consider those, or this is totally? Different? So we looked at something where we could basically get all the features re at a re reasonable cost. So yeah, you have DPDK as an option, but VPP has probably a little bit more features from a networking perspective. We did look, look at BPF, eBPF, but then the, the question was, we wanted something that can work on. Vanilla x86 plus anything that has smart NICs. And I think this did work out as a good choice because you do have VPP implementations provided by most of the DPU vendors. So that was the reason why we actually gravitated towards VPP. And especially if you want to look at cloud auto scenarios, you typically are looking at a lot more detailed functionalities like DPI or next gen firewall and whatnot. So there are a lot of implementations that we could actually leverage from the, whatever we have seen. <coughs> So how is the performance? I mean, last time I looked at uh, VPP was maybe a little ahead of, I, I don't know, ahead is the right way, but at least, you know, performance-wise, DPDK versus VPP, is there anything, is there an update? Okay, so there I think it all depends on what racetrack numbers you're looking at. Since this does a little bit of vectorizing, it's a little bit ahead of DPDK. I mean, that's the claim that's basically around. But you shouldn't go with racetrack numbers if you ask me, right? At the end of the day, it matters is once you enable things with features, the more memory access you have, things starts diving down. So I gave you a racetrack numbers of 1.2 terabits for v 440 Nobody just deploys v 440 You're gonna have ACLs, you're gonna have quads, you're gonna have a lot of other things. So you're gonna see that number come down, but we have a lot of products in our production where we've actually seen pretty good numbers northwards of 100 gig per server, 200 gig per server with VPP, and very heavy duty features. Like for example, the UPF that we have is completely VPP based, and you can run pretty heavy duty call models and you can pretty much get uh, 100, northwards of 100 to 200 gig for m most of those features. Quick question on your second deployment model, right? So where do you see that use case coming in, right? Because DPU is actually trying to switch in the AC itself, right? So where does the VPP play a role in that uh, second deployment model you showed earlier? So that's something we're kind of looking around. So the question boils down to is, okay, how do you actually run VPP on a DPU? Is it, what if, is it going to run the, C, the VPP, master thread runs? So we've been kind of evaluating uh, different options. So one option basically could be is you run VPP on the ARM cores. Let's say you take about a Pencil or one of uh, NVIDIA ASICs, right? You run VPP there, but you use the graph nodes that you have on VPP actually are using the hardware accelerators that are out there. So you pretty much have an inline kind of processing, and you only come to VPP for slow path. Yes. So if you're doing things like, let's say, UPF, all your slow path is basically running on your ARM cores, and you pretty much do everything. And then you probably have to do some sort of a flow kind of an architecture where you really don't need to go to the flow, uh, slow path that frequently. Yeah. You, you have your flow management, and so packets are kind of uh, I bypassed. And even in that case, right? So you'll, you'll go to the ARM, ARM cores there no, rather than the host cores. Right? That's the idea, because uh, in some architectures, going to the host cores is very expensive because you yeah. traverse via the PCI and all that okay. stuff. So. Because the diagram showed it directly goes to the host core. No, no, no. 
Okay. I mean, that's just a sonic link. Okay. It is not for the slow path. Uh, not for the slow. Okay. Got it. Thanks for the clarification. And one more thing, right? So we have uh, a DCSD subgroup. Yeah. We have a DCSD subgroup. Please join there because there are similar efforts, parallel efforts going on in this PPP implementation for SAI. Okay, sure. Right? So we just want to make sure that you are aware of that. Uh, I have a quick question on the architecture, right? So in a system that with multiple core or multiple uh, NIC, where is the mechanism to control? Like uh, which core and the uh, NIC is doing which part of it? Uh, you're talking about from the VPP side? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it, uh, like, uh, let's say if the server have uh, 20 cores and with four NICs. Right. Who do, how do you control like uh, which NIC is doing the participating Yeah, so that this? comes, so if you look at, uh, so the startup conf is the one that actually tells VPP how it needs to actually uh, do. So there's one master thread, and you can have n number of worker threads. You can actually go ahead and do code affinities and all that specification, which we specify via the path JSON to the platform service to the startup. Once okay, so so each one of the startup dot conf control one uh, VPP kind of uh, instance. Yes. And, the and you can actually go ahead and specify: Do you need huge pages? Do you don't want huge pages? What's your policy for core affinities and all that stuff? Thanks. Okay, with that, let's thank uh, Samir and uh, Sasi. Thank you. Ja? Yeah.